Amen. I want to talk to you about being blessed. If you don't like being blessed, you're in the wrong place. Because the will of God is to bless his people. My favorite scripture in the whole Bible is John 10, 10, which says, the Lord came to give life abundant. But the enemy came to kill, to steal, and destroy. He wants to rip us off of favor with God. He wants to rip us off from the blessing of God. God wants to bless his people. One of the things you have to do is you got to fight that mentality that God doesn't want to bless you because he does want to bless you. It's all through his word. And so I want to talk to you about that today. Good place to start is Deuteronomy chapter 28. It talks about the favor of God. It says, all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. It talks about being blessed in the city and blessed in the field and wherever we go, the blessing of God is going to be there for us. But I really like the part where it says these blessings will overtake you. Man, that's like you're going through life and all of a sudden the blessings of God just surround you and then they pass you up and they're going ahead and making a way for you in the future. See, that's the miracle power of God. He wants to do something miraculous. He wants to bring favor in your life, not only today, but for tomorrow. Years from now, God, God's will is to take you someplace today far beyond where you are right now. But it's really important that we believe this. And it, it, and it does say that we got to obey his word. we got to obey his voice. One of the things that I've learned, that if I want God's favor, if I want God's blessing, then I have to obey God's word. I've got to study his word. I've got to read his word. I want to encourage you to begin to study God's word on a daily basis. I love the Bible app called YouVersion. How many are familiar with that Bible app, YouVersion? A lot of you are. You can go on YouVersion and you can get all kinds of devotionals you can do every day. There are hundreds of them on there. There's, I think, 150 translations of the Bible. It's an, it's, it's, it's an incredible app. There's several movies on there and, and uh, things like that. But there's one thing, if you've created a profile and you go to events, you can look up this very message, and, and the, all the images and all my notes will come right down on your cell phone, and you, you can just follow along. You can type in notes, or you can send them off to somebody, or you can post them on your social media. But anyway, we need to get into God's Word. My people perish for their lack of knowledge. See, we have not because we ask not. Ask and ye shall receive. And one of the problems is we don't really know what the Word says. we got to stand upon the Word. We need to live the Word. I love Psalms chapter 35, verse 27. It talks about, it says, let them shout for joy. Who's them? No. Them is other people. You, it, them is the ones that are supposed to be shouting for you. Okay, so think of yourself and have another people shout for you. Are you with me? Let them shout for joy and be glad. Say glad. glad. Who favor my righteous cause and let them continually let the Lord be magnified. See, God wants to bless you, but how many know sometimes when we're blessed, there's people that aren't happy? I mean, you get the promotion at work and there's other people thinking, oh man, what did they get that promotion for? They begin to accuse you and begin to say things like, well, you're just the boss's pet or you're the teacher's pet or, you know, you're, you know, and, and people get upset. But the Bible teaches very clearly that we should rejoice and be glad in someone else's promotion. You know what it means? It means we're just one step closer to our promotion. Amen. We need to get happy when somebody is blessed. When you hear somebody's testimony, and when you hear somebody's, God's done something great in their life, you need to thank God for that and praise God for that. Amen? Amen. And when we do that, it magnifies the name of the Lord, who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. God takes pleasure in the pros your prosperity. God wants you to prosper. Jesus said, I came to give life, but the abundant life. Amen? 
See, it's one thing to have life, but we need to go beyond that and enter into abundance. You know, I love what it says in Joshua 1.8. It says, keep the book of the law or the word of God always on your lips. How do you do that? You quote the word of God to your life. You quote it to your circumstances. You quote it to your job, your school. You quote it to your body. You quote it to uh, your finances. Amen. You meditate on it day and night. That means you think about it. You think about what the word says. When you come into a situation or circumstances, you need to find a scripture for that. You version is a great place to do that too. But you find a scripture. You know, I've got some little pamphlets and I love these things and I use them. And one is words that you speak over your money. Now, I don't know about you, but I want God to bless my money. And so I speak scripture over my finances. Another one is scriptures you speak over your body, over your health. They're called goss pills. And what you need to do is when you're going through something or somebody you love's going through something, you need to get the scriptures and you need to take your goss pills. Oh, come on, come on. Somebody get, get excited here. So you need your goss pills. You need to take your goss pills. So your, your finances do better, so your body does better, so your emotions do better, so your mind does better, so your family does better. You need to speak the word of God over the lives of your children, over your, over your family, over your job. I got news for you. If your job prospers, you're going to prosper. Are you with me? So we need, not everybody where you work is saved. They're not, many of them are cursing their job. But you need to be there blessing the job. Calling forth blessing and, the, and, and over everything written in it, be careful to do everything written in it and you will be prosperous and successful. See, prosperity and success is directly linked to our willingness to get into the word and to live the word, amen? Now I want to share with you this morning about four levels of blessing. I have experienced all four levels of this blessing. I'm going to kind of share my personal life, my, uh, mine and Tammy's, and what we experienced and what God did in our personal lives and how we got there. Because God wants to move us to the next level. Amen? Say the next level. Next level. I don't know what level you're at, but God wants to take you to the next level. And we need to see God taking us someplace in our Christian walk. Once I was blind, but now I see. Once I was lost, but now I'm found. Once I was lame, but now I walk. Amen? Once I had no mind, but now I've got my mind back. Amen? Once I was a thief, but I'm not a thief no more. See, it's a progress of prosperity. God wants to prosper you as a person. He wants you to have more joy. He wants you to have more peace. He wants you to have more victory in your life. Amen? And so we need to trust God for this. That that's what it means to live for God. But let's look at the first level. This is called the beg level. The beg level. Now, we've all been here. You might be at the beg level right now if you're still living with your mom and dad. I'm just saying. You might be at the beg level if you moved out, but you moved back. See, the big level is that level where there's not enough. There's just not enough. Now, listen, I know what I'm talking about because I'll never forget. I got out of high school. I got me a job. I said, I'm moving out. I'm out of here. I moved out. I moved uh, from Prescott down to, to Phoenix here, and I got me a job down here, and I started working, and I started accumulating bills. The problem is my check was not as big as my bills. I'll never forget. Getting a notice that we're being evicted out of our apartment for being late on our rent. And going back home and say, hey, mom, is my room still up available? Can I move back into my room, mom? I remember even after Tammy and I, we got married and we started serving God. There came a time where we had to move back into my dad's house. Amen? Sometimes you got to do that. You got to regroup. Sometimes it takes a while to get out of the nest, amen? If, you, if you've been bouncing back and forth in the nest, don't worry, it's going to come. But this is the beg level. This is the place where there's just not enough. That's why you don't got your own place, amen? Now, Haggai talks about the beg level, and it's rather interesting. It says, 
It is a time for you yourselves to be living in, is it a time for you to be living in these nice homes? Well, this house remains in ruin. It's talking about God's house. In other words, he's speaking to the people and he's saying, you know, you're all making nice homes, but you do nothing about your place of worship. And then it goes on to say, now this is what the Lord Almighty says, give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but harvested little. You, you eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you're not warm. You earn wages only to put them into a purse with holes in it. See, in Malachi chapter 3, and verse 8 through 12, it talks about a spirit called the devourer. The devourer is this demonic force that comes in and gobbles up your money and your resources. Just about the time you're getting ahead, just about the time you got a little extra money, what happens? Something breaks. Something happens. You get this notice that your registration's due on your vehicle. Don't you hate that notice? I mean, I, I never see it coming. It always catches me off guard. What? Just about. And, and what about tax time? You got to pay taxes? You think you're getting a refund? They say, whoa, not this year. <laughs> or what about just about the time you get going in? You think things are going good and the car breaks down. You take it to the garage. You're thinking maybe a hundred bucks. They're thinking about a thousand. You know what I'm talking about? It just eats up, and, and it's like when the thief breaks in and he steals from you and all these kind of things. This is what the enemy wants to do. We need God's divine protection. When we're under God's divine protection, the Bible says that God will rebuke the devourer for his name's sake. But we get under his divine protection when we learn to be obedient to his word. I remember as a young Christian, just got saved, living for God. Now, I had totally ruined my life. I, I was like a mess. I not only ruined my life, I'd ruined anybody's life that I was close to. I was like a plague. I was like a cancer. But thank God I got saved. I found Jesus Christ. I was lost. I was messed up. But I remember during that period of time, you know, just my thoughts, thinking processes wasn't right. I started living for God, and Tammy and I got married, and we're just young, and you know, I'm 22, and she's 20 years old. We're just kids. It's amazing how teenagers think they're not kids no more. My teens are always saying, oh, I'm not a child. And I, you know, I found your brain isn't fully wired to you about 30, 35, someplace in there. I mean, it's just not fully connected. I, that's what I found out for me. But anyway, I, I was in the, in, in the process of trying to get our lives going and turn lives around. And, and, and then they started, I was at a Bible study, and they started talking about this thing called tithe. I said, oh, here it goes. I thought, oh, you know, now they want my money. Uh, are you with me? But I left that Bible study, and I went home, and I started calculating up the money that I got, and I realized that 30% of my money was going towards sin that was destroying my life. 30%. I thought, 30%? That's what I was spending on just drugs and all kinds of things that were shipwrecking my life and ruining me. And now that I was saved, I wasn't doing that anymore. And I thought, now God wants 10%. Well, shoot, I'm 20% ahead. So it made, it made sense to me. I thought, well, well I, okay, I'm in. So I began to tithe. We, we didn't have much. I didn't make much money. When I first got married, I was making $2.75 an hour. I ain't a whole lot of money. Any way you look at it. That's why I was living at my parents' house. We didn't have a whole lot of money. We didn't have a whole lot of stuff. But we began to learn the principle of sewing up the bag. You gotta sew the, you gotta sew up the bag. You know where that money keeps leaking out? Where it's always not enough? Back in those days, we didn't have enough money to even go to a fast food restaurant. We didn't go to them. We didn't go anywhere out to eat. 
But anyway, if we look in Luke, Jesus talks about this. He says, sell what you have and give alms and provide yourself money bags, which do not grow old, a treasure in the heavens that does not fail where no thief approaches nor moth destroys. Talking about the devourer. He says, if you want to stop the devourer, you need to start giving. You need to start giving. Oh, come on. I got two amens out of that whole crowd here. Oh, I'm about to give you some carne asada. Come on. You can do better than that. So you got to learn to be a gift. There's something in the principle of God's word. When you become a giver, he becomes involved in your increase in prosperity. That it's, it's a direct link. There is a direct link, and, and that's what we have to learn to do. Amen? Not be a hoarder. You know, the big level, that's what uh, we read about Judas Iscariot was at. Remember the story of Judas Iscariot? He kept the money bag for Jesus and all the disciples. You know, when they got an offering, when people gave to Jesus' ministry, he kept the money. One day, a woman came along, and she took an entire year's wage. Think about how much you make in a year. She took her entire year's wage and brought, bought this very expensive perfume, and she put it on the body of Jesus to bless him. And Judas, he got upset. See, at the big level, you get upset when you see things like that. He got a little bit upset, and he says, he, he, he did not say this because he cared about the poor, because what he said is this, this money should have been given to the poor, not just given to Jesus. Jesus said, the poor you'll always have. Now, look, there's a big truth here. And he said, but he goes on to say, he, what he really cared about, he was a thief, and he was stealing money out of the money bag. Oh, it's getting quiet here. See, I'm, I'm talking about a principle here. You need to rejoice in your ability to bless other people. God wants to bless you, but till you learn to want to be a blessing, you're, you're, you're holding back the favor of God. There's something about here that it sews up that money bag, the place where there's never enough. And once you learn this, you'll step into the next level, which I call the jar level, the jar level where there's just enough. Now, this is a much better place. This is when you finally move out from mom and dad's house. Are you, are you with me? Or, or you finally got your own place, and, and you're making it. You're actually making it. You're making your car payment. You're making your rent. You're making your utilities. You're buying your groceries. I mean, you even have a dollar thirty-two left at the end of the week. You're making it. You finally made it. We're making it. I remember when we began to make it, we got our own place and moved out of dad's house, amen? And we got our own house, we rented our own place. And, well, we didn't have a lot but back in those days, but we, we got our own place. And Tammy, she used to spend $20 a week on groceries. Yeah, $20 a week. But she would get the newspaper and cut out all the coupons. And she was like, had this big purse full of coupons, and she did the coupon thing. And that's how she got by. But, you know, and, and then there was a time that, that we were on WIC. You know, how many know about WIC food? WIC food is where you need a hatchet to cut the cheese. <laughs> <laughs> you, you lose your filling in that cheese or that peanut butter. It bends your spoon. You try to scoop it out, and it just bends the spoon. I mean, she got beans and rice and all that kind of stuff, and that helped out. But we were making it. We're out actually on our own now. Amen? We didn't have anything extra, but we were making it. We were still putting God first, though. We're still giving. We're still tithing. Now, the Bible talks about this level in 1 Kings chapter 17. This is a really interesting story. 1 Kings chapter 17. Elijah, who's the, the man of God, he's like the prophet of the day. It's a tremendous famine in, in the land. It, 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 there's been no rain. There's no crops. People are suffering. Elijah's suffering. He's come to the place the brook has dried up, and he's no longer being fed and by the ravens. And he's, he's come to this place, and God speaks to him, I want you to go to the widow Zarephath 
and I want you to have her feed you. So Elijah says, okay, God, if that's what you want to do, I'll go. So he knocks on her door. She opens the door and says, can I help you? Elijah, the prophet, I'm so glad to see it. He says, oh, God told me to come over here and you'd make me something to eat. And this is what she said. But she said, I swear to the Lord, your God, that I don't have a single piece of bread in this house. And I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. And I was just gathering a few sticks to cook the last meal. And then my son and I are going to die. Now you'd think Elijah would go, oh, uh, wrong house. (laughs) But his response is unbelievable. He comes back and he says, but Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. See, the difference between increase and decrease is fear and faith. Fear and faith are the same thing. They're the same, same thing. If you have fear, that means you have faith in the bad. If you have faith in the good, that's what we call faith. Are you with me? He says, don't be afraid. Don't, don't worry about dying. Go ahead and do just what you said, but make a little bread for me first. See, the Bible talks about our first fruits need to go to God. So I, we began as, as young Christians, we, we'd get us a piece of paper like this and we, I'd put down how much I made and remember I started out at two seventy five an hour, eventually I got a job $5 an hour, I mean we're living high and I'd put down you know, my income and then over on the right the first bill I put was my tithe. Because God said that's the first fruits. And then the next thing I put was food. Because I figure I can sleep on the street. I can sleep in mom's house. But I need food. And then on down, went on down the list there. But I put that first. And that's what it's talking here is, is give it, that to me first. Then use what is left and prepare a meal for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, there will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends rain and crops again. Now this went on from this day for three and a half years. She had just enough for one last meal. She put the man of God first, and I'm not asking any from me. I'm just telling you what the Bible is talking. She put the kingdom of God first. Are you with me? And God provided for her again and again, day after day after day after day after day after day after day. God provided for her for three and a half years until the rain came again and the harvest came and they were just going to be just fine. And her son probably grew up and he was a strong young lad now and he could go work in the fields. See, I'm telling you what, if you put God first, he'll put you first. And I don't know about you, but I need God's help. See, I need, I, when I came to the Lord, I, I knew that I had ruined my life. I remember praying and saying, God, I am only 22 years old and I've already ruined my life. And I said, God, if you get me out of the mess I created, I'll give you the rest of my life. And that's why I stand here preaching before you today, 39 years later, simply because I know that it was Jesus that set me free. It was Jesus that gave me my mind back. It was Jesus that healed me and transformed me and redeemed me. And I I was an angry, mad, ugly person. But God changed me by his grace. And I've never forgotten that. I would not be anything. It's by his mercy and nothing else. Nothing, Nothing about me. It's all about his goodness and his grace. And it was such an exciting time when we could move out of my dad's house and move into our own little rental. And we had our old little car. You know, Tammy had a VW Bug, and, and, and uh, it, it was uh, what we, we drove in, and we had that. And, and, but God blessed us, amen? He blessed us, and we were favored by God. Then the next level is the basket level, amen? Now, I'm talking about moving up a level. I don't know what level you're at, but you can move up a level. You can move up a level. 
But you got to trust God because God's the one that we need help from. The basket level, you remember the story? The young boy, and he had four lo- loaves of bread, and he had two fish, and, and, and there were, Jesus was preaching a long sermon, and he preached so long, the disciples come up and says, hey, Master, i uh, been talking a long time, and people are really hungry. So you're thinking that right now. It's not ready yet, though. And he said, we ought to let the people go. They got, get, he says, why don't you just feed them? And they go, what? I mean, it, the Bible says there's 5,000 men alone, not to count the women and the children there. And they go, oh, we, we don't got enough money to feed these people. And a little boy, about 12 years old, walks up, and he says, I got my lunch. I, I'll give that. See, there's something about what he did that God turned into a miracle. You remember the story? Jesus prayed over it. He blessed it. I'm talking about the blessed life. See, when God prays over your life, when God blesses your life, there's increase. There's increase. And and Jesus prayed over it, and they fed everybody there. But here's the exciting part. There was more than enough because the boy took home 12 baskets of food, the Bible says. He came with one. He left with 12. Now I'm talking stepping into the level of, of more than enough. I mean, you you got more. More than enough is when you can go out to eat. You can say, you know, I'm hungry. Where do you want to eat? And you go get something to eat. Remember before, you know, when we were at the bag level, I can tell you, I remember that level. Tammy was telling me, she said, you know, I used to go over to my mom's while you were at work just to get something to eat. She'd say, Mom, hey, good to see you. She said, you were just here yesterday. Yeah, yeah. She has her head inside the refrigerator, <laughs> feeding the kids. Oh, come on. You know what it's like to be at this level. It's not an easy place. It's a hard place. But God is in the process of moving us to a better place. That's what I want you to see here today. It doesn't matter where you're at today. God wants to take you someplace better. Amen. So anyway, I remember when Tammy and I first got married, and we just had a, a little job. I had a little job, made $2.75 an hour. And we didn't have anything, and it was kind of a hard time. But you know what? God took us step by step by step by step, and we moved into that place where we had more than enough. And there came a day when my wife told me, said, I'm not going to go down to that wick place anymore and stand in that line. I said, but, you know, we get all this good cheese. And she said, you go stand in that line. Well, that was the last time we ever went down to that line. <laughs> but anyway, you know, we, got, we began to have enough. I, I, I now had a pretty good job, and they gave me a vehicle to drive, and we're making pretty good money, and we, we were, you know, living in this house. And I remember uh, it, it was my first church. We were pastoring in Tucson, Arizona, and, and the, the home we lived in was right next to the church. It was like an a old storefront. It, it had been a barber college is what it had been. That's where we had the church. Didn't even have A.C. Tucson, Arizona, no A.C., and we lived in an adobe house that was built in 1936, not for the farmer, but for his worker. That was our home. It wasn't a very fancy home, in it, but it was adequate. We were staying there. We, we could afford the rent, and, and so we're living there. And then these people came to church. This couple came to church, and they gave their life to the Lord and so I went by to visit them. I went by their house to see them. And it was about two blocks from the church. And I go there and I go, wow, that is a nice house. So I go inside their house and I talk to them a little bit. And I said, man, how much did it cost to rent this house? And they said, $400 a month. Four bedrooms, backyard, front yard, nice looking house. Only two, two blocks from the church. And so anyway, you know, they came a couple of more weeks, and then they quit coming all together, and they began to go back on their drugs and all that kind of stuff. Their lives fell apart, and they got evicted from that house. So I went over to that house, 
And it was vacant now. And I walked around it. And I laid hands on it. I said, God, these people ain't even serving you. And you gave them a house. They got a house like this. God, I'm living in this old farmer's house. God, I, I want to move my family into this house. God, I want to be able to rent this house. God, I'm believing you for this house. God, give me this house. God, I want this house. I walked all around. I caught, went in the backyard. I didn't care. I just, I, I, I walked around the whole house. I would have gone inside if it had been unlocked. <laughs> laid hands on it. There was no first rent sign or anything, but I thought, you know what? I heard you can find out the owner by going to the county assessor. So I checked at the county assessor, and sure enough, the owner lived in New Mexico. Had lived in Tucson, moved to New Mexico. So I uh, found his address, found his phone number, called him up, and says, hey, uh, some people in my church used to rent your house, and I would like to rent it. And he says, well, it's not for rent because I sold it. And I go, dang. My heart sank. So I went back, and then I thought, you know what? I'm not going to accept this. I'm not going to be satisfied with this. I'm not going to accept it. So I went back to the house, and I laid hands on it again. I said, God, if I can't have this house, then I demand. I'm your servant. I pay my tithes. I give faithfully. I don't miss a week. I give every week. I demand you find me a house like this. God bless me. Give me and my family a better house. So three months go by, and every now and then I drive by that house because I wanted to look at the people that stole it from me. <laughs> and nobody moved in, nobody moved in, and nobody moved in, and nobody moved in. And so finally, I called the guy back, and I says, hey, nobody ever moved into the house. And he says, that's because the deal fell through. I said, will you rent it to me now? And you know what he said? No. He said, I want to sell it, but I'll sell it to you. I said, sir, all I have in the bank is $100. I can't afford to buy your house. I couldn't even get a loan if I wanted to. He says, I want it outright. I'll carry the paper. How much can you afford to pay a month? I said, $400. And he says, okay, you give me that $100 and $400 a month, that'll be your, your mortgage payment. And we moved into our house. Now I'm talking about the basket level, more than enough. Amen. We painted that house. We painted the inside, the outside. We got some carpet we put in there. We planted grass in the front yard, in the backyard, and we made this our house. This was our land, our dirt, our place. I'm talking about more than enough. Amen? You know, there's a scripture in the Bible that talks about how you think. How you think. And you shall remember, don't ever forget this. If the day you forget this will be the day you go backwards. I've seen it happen to so many Christians. God blesses them. They begin to live for God. He begins to do great things in their life. And they forget that it's God that got them to where they're at. They start to think they got them themselves there. No, you were ruining your life. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. It's he that gives you the power to get wealth. Don't ever forget that. So I want to talk about the final level, and that's the barn level. This is an incredible level because at the barn level, you not only have more than enough, but you have so much that you can bless people you don't even know. You can give to missions, and you, you can touch people in other countries, and, and you can touch people in your community, and, and it's a place of tremendous blessing, the barn level. And I remember we, you know, lived in that house in Tucson, Arizona, and then we got the opportunity to go to Kenya to be missionaries, and it was in 1989 we moved to Kenya, became missionaries over there, and began to serve God in Kenya in 1990, and and, and we lived for God, and after two years of being on the mission field, we came home for a short three-month furlough where we got to come back and, and see our family and stuff, and, and we got to go back to this international Bible conference where we had, uh, you know, been sent out from. And so we're at this Bible conference, and we're sitting there, and they're taking an offering on Thursday night for missions. Now, when we first got back to uh, Arizona, when we first got back, we had been renting our house, 
and we were able to sell our house. We made $10,000. Now, I'd never had $10,000 before in my life. I felt like the richest man in the world. I mean, we put that money in the bank, and we, we, we were excited. We made $10,000, and, 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 and this is that house that guy sold us uh, for $100 down. We made $10,000 profit. So later on that week, we're sitting in this conference on a Thursday night, and they're raising money to send these missionaries overseas. We're already missionaries, and God speaks to us, I want you to give a large sum of money for missions. I want you to give $5,000. Well, I'd never given $5,000. I didn't even know you could give $5,000. I didn't even know anybody who had ever given $5,000. And I'm going, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me. I mean, I just put the money in the bank, and the devil knows. The devil knows when you get a check. He knows. But God's speaking to me. He speaks to Tammy. So we write out a check for $5,000 and drop in that Offering bucket, even though we're missionaries. And we go back over to Kenya for another two years. Finally come back here to Phoenix and we start a church over in the east side there. And All we could afford was a rental, so we rented a place. We're back kind of to the place of having just enough. Are, are you with me? Sometimes we, we take a step back. You ever take a step back? Well, don't let that discourage you because God's all about taking. You may take a step back, but then he's going to take three steps ahead. Amen? So we're renting a place, and we like it, but uh, on driving between our rental and the church, I see, this, uh, I see this place where they're breaking the ground, and they got earth-moving machines, and they're going to build some houses. And so I, I thought, man, this is so convenient. I drive right by this place. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get a brand-new house? And so I stopped in there, and I knew I didn't have any money. I, I had the $5,000 still. But I really didn't know that that was enough money. So I stopped in there and they said, how can we help you? I said, well, can you tell me about the houses? And they said, well, we've got four different models and, you know, there's a smaller one and it goes on up. And I knew I didn't, when I saw the price, I knew I didn't have the money for the small one. So I said, well, show me the big one. I mean, if you're going to dream, dream big, amen? I'm, I'm telling you, dream big. I said, well, show me the big one. And so they did all these calculations and said, you're going to have to have $10,000 down payment to get into this place. And I thought, man, I used to have $10,000. <laughs> so I said, well, I need to talk it over with my wife. She wasn't there. Honestly, I, it was my way out, you know. And so um, anyway, I went and brought the brochure home. I told Tammy and We've just prayed. We just prayed. He said, God, we want to own our own house. Help us to get a brand new house. We just prayed. Lo and behold, two weeks go by. And in that two weeks, I get a notice from the diner's club. Now, the diner's club is a credit card or it's a bank. Uh, It's now associated with BMO banks. But back then, it was pretty much an international bank. Are, Are you following me? So when we were in Kenya, the money we were using... For the ministry there, we put into the Diners Club Bank. So we had planted some churches, quite a few churches in India. And we were bringing the Indian pastors and their wives to Kenya to this international Bible conference. And we're buying all the airfare and all this kind of stuff. It was a lot of money. And one of the Kenyans that ran the bank robbed the bank, took everything. Now, I'm talking they cleaned it out, and they closed the bank. We lost all our money. We couldn't fly these people over. We couldn't do anything. It was gone, gone forever. Two years later, are you following me? Two years later, only two weeks after I've gone by this house, I get a check in the mail from the, the diner's club for 5000 some odd dollars. We were able to step into our, uh, go down and uh, we went right down and we bought that house. I'm telling you, there's a God in heaven. These are miracles. These are something you engineer or invent or try to make. This is living at the barn level. Amen. Then there came a day and uh, I was out here buying a car. This is back in 1997, 1998, I think it was, over at the Greater Fenior Auto Auction, there was nothing out here but farms. All there was was farmland out there. And I was over there, and I saw this flag flying down here. 
I thought, are they building houses way out here? And I just felt the Lord again leading me. You've got to be sensitive to the voice of the Lord. So I, I followed, I, went to, I drove down uh, 83rd Avenue right over here to uh, the corner. It's a subdivision they were building here. They hadn't even built a house yet. They just had that temporary trailer again. Now I had the house over in, in Phoenix that we got blessed with. But I went in there and they said, listen, we're trying to get people to move out here. And for the first three or four buyers, we're giving the incredible deal of selling this house for $46 a square foot, brand new house. I go, woo, I can do this. We sell our house. We buy this house. Our payment's going down. Are, are you following me? We're going to owe less money and be in a bigger house. They even had a bigger model. So I raced home. I told Tammy, I says, Tammy, I'm so excited. And she says, I ain't moving. She says, you've moved me all over the world, back and forth. You've moved me several times in Kenya. I, I'm not moving. But I felt it was God. I wouldn't pray, God, what? How can I get Tammy to agree to this? And, and, and God spoke to me, tell her you'll throw in a swimming pool. So I went back to her and I says, what if we get a swimming pool? She says, Okay. It was that fast. So anyway, that house right across the street, that two-bedroom right over there is the house we lived in. It has a nice swimming pool, and, 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 and we sold our house over there in Phoenix for a big profit, and we were, our payment went down, and we had a bigger house. Are you with me? And then there's a story that goes about how this, this church came about through all that. I don't have time to tell you that story, how God gave us $1.5 million to buy this property and build this building. That's another story. The 101 class, that's where I share that story. But anyway, so we're living over in here for several years, and uh, all of a sudden, we began to dream that we wanted a custom home. You know, a custom home is where you draw the plans or have somebody draw the plans. You decide what it's going to look like and everything. It's usually on an acre or more. So we began to travel around and look at all these custom home sites and it was way out of our league. I mean, way out of our league. It was like, I don't know how that's ever going to happen. But we just kept dreaming. I'm going to tell you something. Never stop dreaming. God's looking for dreamers, amen? So we just kept dreaming, and we kept believing, and we'd go down to Home Depot, and we'd buy all these books full of these plans, and we'd sit around and look at them. And we had a realtor in the church here that kept taking us around, showing us property we couldn't afford. One day, he says, I found, I found a place I think you can afford. It's five acres. It's $135,000. Well, let's go look at it. That was a lot of money, but I thought, we'll go look at it. We only need an acre. We go and drive out there. It's out there right in, up on the mountains in the Australia Mountains. But this five acres is nothing but gully wash. You can't build anything on it. And I go, I said, why, why are we even looking at this? And, and he goes, I didn't have any idea. I just saw the listing and I said, sorry. So he drove us up to Australia and that's a nice area. And, but he showed us another house. It was just on a small lot. And it was going to be just similar to the house we had here. And I, we didn't want to do that. And I, I, I turned to Tim and I said, but what about the land we parked on and walked over to see that other land? I felt God's favor there. Tammy said, I felt his favor too. I said, let's, let's, can, can you see about buying that land? Let's go back and look at that. So we looked at it. It was a nice five acres. You could build on almost the whole thing, build several houses there. So anyway, I, I said, can you see if you'll sell this? The, he said, well, I don't know who, who it is, but I'll find out and see if they'll sell. How much do you want to offer? I said, offer him 100000 He said, I can't do that. I said, why? He says, because this land's worth a lot more than 100000 and that would just, you just don't do that in real estate. That would just be like rude. That would just be like an insult. He'd be offended. And I said, I want to teach you something about the favor of God. I said, offer him 100000 So he offered the guy 100000 He countered at 118 I went down and closed our IRAs. I, I cashed in everything I could cash in, our, our IRAs, our retirements, to get that little, you know, 20% down that I could get a loan. And I got a loan, and we bought that land. And we began to set on that land. We couldn't afford a house out there, but we set on that land. Two or three times a week, we'd drive out there, and we'd stop at Taco Bell. 
And we'd take out some folding chairs and we'd pull out our, our drinks and our, our, our Taco Bell tacos and we, we would sit there and dream and look at these house plans and we'd stake out houses. But we had our land. Are you with me? I didn't know what we were going to do, but this realtor says, why don't you sell half of the land, build a, a spec home on that and, and make enough money to build your house? I said, I'm in. How do you do that? He told me it wasn't that big of a deal, so we did it. And, and uh, lo and behold, we got the plans approved for that spec home, and it sold the very next week. We didn't even start construction on the house, and we already sold the house. We made enough money to pay off that other two and a half acres completely, completely, 100%, and to start building a new house. Now, we live in a beautiful home now. And I'm not, I'm not apologizing for it. I'm testifying to how good God is. I mean, it's 5,000 square feet under roof. It's on two and a half acres. It's beautifully landscaped. 3,800 square feet uh, that's actually uh, air conditioned. It's a beautiful home. But let me tell you what happened. We were able to move into that house for less money than we were paying over here, less money than we were paying back at the first house in Phoenix, our mortgage right now, we only own about $150,000. And it's a beautiful home. I'm talking about the barn level. How many want to move into the barn? See, the barn level, but, but now God's put us in a place that we can give to missions, and we've been given to the missions for years and doing all kinds of things. God also wants our church to be in the barn level. See, that's why we need to give to missions. A lot of times we think, well, why don't we just concentrate on ourselves? Folks, I want to move into the next dimension. I want to build a new sanctuary. If we're going to build a new sanctuary, then we need to do something for other people. I close with this scripture. The Lord will send that blessing. See, we need a blessing. When he sends a blessing, you increase on your barns and on everything you put your hand to. The Lord your God will bless you in the land he is giving you. God wants to give you some land. I said, God wants to give you some land. I want you to believe that. Really believe that. God wants you to have some land. It's a big earth. You need, you need your piece of land. Amen? You might be at the bag level right now and say, I don't even know how that happened. I never knew how this happened. I just went along for the ride. It doesn't happen overnight, but God is real. Amen? God is real. I want to challenge you today. God wants to do something great in your life. Would you bow your heads with me? As our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, we'd be in attitude of prayer. I wonder how many people say, you know, Pastor Joe, I'm not right with God. Now, I I, I want you to see something in the Word. For God to do a miracle in your life, you have to give him something. The beginning is when you give him your life. You surrender your life to him. That's what it means, Lord and Savior. First, he becomes your Lord, your boss, your ruler, your king. You give him your life. Then, he becomes your Savior. I want to challenge you, if you've never given your life to God, Give it to him. He can do something wonderful with your life. He can turn it around. He can can heal what's broken. He can restore what the the locust and worm has eaten from your life. He can give back. He can can recreate you. He can restore that which you've lost. He can bring the joy back into your life. He can give you a peace. But you have to give him your life first. First. That is the first fruits. So I wonder, as heads are bowed and eyes are closed, how many say, you know, Pastor Joe, I want to do that today. This is just between you and God. If you want to do it today, raise your hand up. Yes, sir. God sees, sees your hand. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. In extended seating, God sees those hands go up there. There's hands going up all across this sanctuary. They're everywhere. God sees your hand. Raise it up if, if this is you. Raise it up. Let God see your hand. Say, God, I'm giving you my life today. God wants to do something with, for you. He wants to touch you. He loves you. He cares for you. Okay, you can put him down. I want to lead you in a prayer. Just pray these words after me in sincerity. Really mean it. It's a prayer where you just surrender your life to God and say, God, I'm giving you me as I am. 
See, we don't have to fix ourselves. We just give God ourselves. And he does the fixing. Pray this prayer with me. Matter of fact, I'm going to ask the whole church to support those who raise their hands and just pray this. Let's all pray this prayer. Say, Heavenly Father, today I give you my life. I surrender to you completely. I accept Jesus Christ as my boss, my ruler, my king, my Lord. Holy Spirit, fill me with your presence. Make me a new person. Change my life. Set me free from those things that have been destroying me. Forgive me for the mistakes I've made in life. Show me grace and save me today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let's give the Lord a clap offering and thank him for that. Amen.